What is normal? I mean, is it having two eyes? Is it having straight teeth? These are the kinds of questions that scientists deal with every day. And if you think about it, it can be kind of a complicated question. I mean, what makes you normal? Is it the fact that you have two arms and two legs? What if someone was born with three legs? How would society treat them? These are the kinds of questions that scientists have to deal with on a regular basis. And scientists tend to think of these problems in terms of something called populations. You, by yourself, are an individual. If you have more than one person, then you become a population. Scientists tend to look at these populations in terms of all their different characteristics. And as scientists are comparing all these different characteristics, they create what's called a distribution. A distribution, if I could spell correctly, is the sliding scale of science. A sliding scale means that it starts on one end and goes to the other end. Here's an example. Poor little Johnny is the shortest kid in class, while Ralphie May is the tallest kid in class. This is a distribution of people. They start off at one end, either the small or the tall, and they move to the other end. So on one end you have the tallest person in class, and on the other end you have the smallest, and this is a distribution. Most people on average are between five feet and six feet tall. Or to take another example, think of shoe size and the number of people who have those shoe sizes. Most people aren't going to have a one shoe size and most people aren't going to have a ten shoe size. Most people will end up somewhere in the middle at the five, the six, or the seven shoe size. So most people have a shoe size in the middle of the graph. So that is why that part of the line is the highest because most people have that shoe size. Or my favorite example. Let's pretend that we have a group of people and they are all offered some cookies. How many cookies do you think that people will eat? I, of course, would want to eat one cookie, maybe even two, but once you get to around three cookies, I start to get a feel a little sick because I've had too many cookies. That is why around the four or the five range, most people will stop eating the cookies. You can go up to a certain range, but after a while, you just don't want to eat any more cookies, and this is what I call the cookie theorem. The same ideas are true in evolution. Populations in the wild have a distribution that is fairly normal. Let's take, for example, a group of gorillas and how much they weigh. Most gorillas will be somewhere in the middle. Not too many will be skinny and not too many will be big. Most gorillas will be in the average range. And this is a normal distribution. There are also many things that will change a population's distribution. For instance, let's go back to those gorillas that we were talking about. Gorillas, just like every other animal in the wild, need food. So if the amount of food in the wild goes down, theoretically, also, their weight would go down. If you want to see this represented in a graph, you just draw a graph, on the y-axis put the number of gorillas, and on the x-axis put their weight. If you look at the old average, maybe it was somewhere around 70 kilograms. I just made that number up. And let's say the new average would be 50 kilograms, and it has made a shift or a change in distribution. There are basically three ways in evolution to make a change in a population. The first one is called directional selection. The second one is called stabilizing selection. And the last one is called disruptive selection. Let's take a look at directional selection using viruses. There are drug resistant viruses and viruses that are not drug resistant. Up until the 1940s, it didn't really matter because people couldn't take drugs. But now people can take drugs to get rid of viruses. And so viruses that are not drug resistant have a lesser chance of just surviving. So if you look at a graph with the number of viruses in the world, it didn't matter back in the day if you had a low or high drug resistance as a virus. But nowadays it does matter, and so there's an advantage towards the high drug resistors. You have the old mean average and the new mean average. The drug example is directional selection because it has changed the direction of the mean or the average, either to the left or the right. Let's go back to the cookie example because I love cookies. Let's say, for instance, that instead of the regular average or mean that we had around three or four, let's say that most people now want to eat cookies because doctors say that it's good for you. This might increase the amount of people that eat a lot of cookies and they would have a new average. This is called stabilizing selection because it is much narrower than the normal distribution in the middle. The final example of selection is called disruptive selection and it's somewhat complex because it deals with animal social behavior. Let's say, for instance, that we can have a bird that either has all brown feathers, all blue feathers, or somewhere in the middle. Let's say that the females like the brown birds, but that other males see the brown birds as a threat, and so they try to kill them. And because nobody wants the birds in the middle, this is known as a disruptive selection because nobody wants the birds in the middle of, or the average. 
So just to review, when the mean shifts, it's known as directional selection. When the mean gets higher in the middle, it's known as stabilizing selection. And finally, when you have a graph where the middle of the mean goes down and it's high on both sides, that is known as disruptive selection because there's nothing in the middle. And that is your introduction to the different types of natural selection.